I'm here with Russ Thomas, CEO of Velity in Florida. Russ, thank you so much for setting aside the time and welcome to the show. Great to see you. Awesome. So Russ, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Velity? Yeah, sure. Uh, how much time we have? <laughs> I'll give you the short version. Um, the company's been around for 21 years now, so we're two decades old. We've been uh, in healthcare technology since arguably before it was cool to be in healthcare tech. Uh, at our core, we connect health plans and providers so that they can run their respective businesses more efficiently. We connect them for their business uh, transactions, their business data exchange. What that means in um, practical terms is that we've got 2 million providers on one side of our two-sided network. And on the other side, we have every health plan. And between them, we transact roughly 13 billion transactions um, a year, um, including claims. If you look at sort of aggregate claims value through our network, it's somewhere around two and a half trillion dollars of claims billed through the availability network on an annual basis. So a lot of activity, a lot of economic activity, a lot of business activity between two of the critical stakeholders in the healthcare uh, ecosystem. And um, we see a lot of things pay, I guess, is sort of the best way to. Yeah, you're, you're right in the middle between the two most important sources of healthcare data, the claim data on the insurance provider, insurance company side, and all the uh, patient medical information from the provider side, right? So just to just to make sure that I understand this model right. So Verity sits in the middle. Neither party really gets to see the other party's data, but Verity has the ability to use the data and combine the data in ways that create business value for both sides without necessarily each side seeing the other side's data directly. Am I correct? Yeah, well, it's it's a great question. It's, you know, who owns what, I guess, is sort of core to that question, right? So a provider would say, well, when we create a claim, um, you know, the work that goes into the creation of that claim is our work. So that is our data. Mm -hmm. We send that data through availability to the health plans. They receive it in the form of a, of a claim, right? Um, the payer would then say, of course, at that point, the claim becomes theirs and the corresponding remittance or response you know, is theirs. But then again, when the provider gets that back into their system, well, now suddenly that's their data. So we don't typically get into the sort of who owns what um, uh, debate between health plans and providers. And generally speaking, I think the industry has been fairly practical about these ownership rights when it comes to business workflows and have been more focused on getting the workflow automated than you know, sort of haggling over data rights in the context of is yeah. it claims data, is it medical data, and who owns it? So is medical data, since you mentioned that, uh, specifically EHR data, also part of the data sets that are covered here? Yeah, precisely. So um, historically, we've been almost purely administrative data, but over the last several years, we've begun to move more and more medical data, which we generally, you know, sort of generically call clinical uh, data in various forms, ACD, CCD, uh, ADT, CCD, you know, a variety of formats. Um, as you may have uh, seen, uh, about a little over a month ago, we closed on the acquisition of Diameter uh, Health, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit during the podcast, yeah. but we're very excited about, about that because, as you know, right, you're, you're incredibly experienced here as well. Um, you know, if you know, people sort of think that structured you know, X12 data is very standardized unless you work with it every day in which you realize that it's not really as standardized as you might think that it that it is. I always joke if you've if you've seen one payer uh, implementation, you've seen one payer implementation because they're all different. Um, when it comes to clinical data, it's still very much the Wild West in terms of how data is facilitated, created, transacted, you know, named, identified. I mean, there's still a lot of opportunity for to provide structure around clinical data so that it can be used and automated into workflows, which is where we are. We're very much we're very much focused. And, and there is some HIPAA consideration here as well, right? When yeah, it comes of course. To, uh, what may be one of the, you know, maybe one or two top considerations when it comes to this kind of exchange of data that, that our listeners uh, uh, should yeah. know about? Yeah, great question. And then it plays to a bit of our strategy. So, you know, one thing we've never done, Patty, is we've never sold data. Uh, we have a lot of claims data. 
a lot of remittance data, a lot of very valuable data flowing through our networks. Um, but we've always felt like it's better to be a trusted data steward um, than a, you know, than a data broker. And so um, just as any firm like ours, you might imagine we, you know, we take secure information security and privacy uh, very seriously. I think the fact that we've not been in the business of selling data has enabled us to have trust with both sides of the equation, payers and providers, um, which we think is going to let us create some really interesting use cases for data in that business workflow. But to your specific question, um, you know, you have just your core underlying concern of let's make sure the data about the right person is going to the right person at the right time. You know, our network, like any healthcare network, is constantly under some form of assault by people trying to breach it and get into it. So um, we spend a small fortune on information security and, and, and privacy. And then beyond that, I think it's sort of where you're going. You know, once you move from those standard business transactions, which sort of everybody, you know, opts into, to how do you really use that clinical data to create a better healthcare system? You got to be super careful about data rights, um, you know, both in terms of the payer and the provider, as well as the patient who some would say ultimately, you know, own all the data. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, you know, for those listening uh, who had never heard of Availity, you're one of the best kept secrets in the country, I guess, been around a long time, run a highly successful yeah. business. Uh, you have some really, really uh, well-known sponsors, uh, big insurance companies, among others. Now, you recently made an acquisition. You referred to a diameter health. Tell us a little bit about that. What, yeah. was, what was the business case? What do they bring to the table? Yeah, great business. So. I use, you know, I'm, I'm not a very smart person, so I use analogies that I can understand, right, which is, you know, the way we think about clinical data is, you know, there's a lot of data being mined uh, out there in the market. So we, we do a lot of it. There's a number of data, you know, aggregators and data collection sources that are out all day, every day, um, drilling for oil, so to speak, or in this case, drilling for data. And we have a lot of it. Um, what we have found is missing is the ability to take that raw crude and turn it into um, a usable fuel. And so what Diameter really is, is a data refinery. We take data and is today, Diameter of course gets data from a variety of sources. So they don't actually have endpoints into provider systems to gather any data. They're wholly dependent upon um, their customers to create those endpoints. So there's one synergy with availability, right? Because we're out creating endpoints for data all day, every day. What Diameter really does, though, is they pull that data in from all these disparate sources and they refine it. They refine it to a particular client's standard, whether that client is a payer, whether that client is an HIE, whether that client is, you know, they, they have they have business in uh, the government uh, sector. Um, uh, with VA, they have a variety of different customers who have said, we have use cases for clinical data to drive better health outcomes, cost reduction, you know, all the things that we want to see happen. But all this data comes in in such a varied way that our ability to automate the flow of that data into a utilization management system or a um, HEDIS and STARS reporting system or a care management, um, you know, look, you know, gaps in care kind of system is um, it, it's hard to achieve uh, that at scale because the data is so fragmented. So that's what Diameter does. Diameter applies that applies their tech to uh, raw data, and you know they the term we use or they have coined is upcycle. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what they're doing is taking that data, they're deduping it, they're standardizing, they're creating structure for it, they're applying clinical um, knowledge to the data. So for the first time in a long time, I have actually clinicians working in the availability organization. We have nurse practitioners and farm Ds who are looking at you know, data structures as it comes in and applying standards to those data structures so that when we flow it back to the end user client, it can be pushed into an automated workflow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unsexy stuff, but incredibly valuable. Incredibly right? valuable, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, I, I I had a quick question on the data sources. Have you, have you started tapping into individual data? Like, individuals who get access to their data, yeah, you know, because of the interoperability, final routing, information blocking, all of that, all of that data is getting unlocked and is coming into the hands of individuals. Have you figured out a way to tap into it? So we've not, we aren't, we've never had a sort of direct to consumer strategy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might say yes, because we're direct to provider 
and the provider is ultimately the source of a lot of the data that, that the, the health plans need and vice versa. The health plan is the source of a lot of the data that the provider needs. But, you know, it's a great question. We've never really embarked on that, you know, sort of direct to consumer um, strategy that feels like a pretty big lift and one that, frankly, for the use cases that we are bringing to life, you know, there's a lot of Patty, as you know, there's a lot of low hanging fruit and just automating workflows like authorization, uh, HEDIS and STARS, care management um, kinds of workflows. And, and for that, the data that's required by the plans, right, to approve an authorization or to to um, code, you know, appropriately for HEDIS and STARS purposes is in the provider systems. And so that's where we're really focused on our data capture. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, authorization. And prior auth is one of the biggest, biggest friction points yeah. in healthcare. And uh, where I'm going with this is, uh, you know, who else does this? What is your competitive landscape? There have been uh, recent entrants in this space. For instance, you know, Anthem did this partnership with Epic, uh, and Epic's yep. platform that you know automates the prior auth process for, I guess, a limited number of cases and automates it and so on. Does your business compete with them, or are they creating something different and unique? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure thing. In fact, in that particular one, and really in others where you know you have the payer partnering with Epic, we have a great relationship with Epic, and obviously serve as the gateway for. The payers that you that you've identified and um you know we're right in the middle of those helping to automate that that data and those workflows so we're big fans of of automation whether it comes in an epic system or whether it comes in you know any other um, uh, uh, application um off to your point is i would say the biggest pain point uh between providers and health plans today and uh, it's one that frankly has not been solved um, at scale. As I said, I really do like what Epic's doing with you know the Epic payer platform and driving um, auth automation there. And I think that's going to be an important source. And I think frankly will you know be a um, catalyst for a lot of other innovation around auth over the next few years. Apologies, my dogs are acting that's up. That's fine. That's what makes this podcast authentic, Russ. So you're you know. Everybody knows that this is real. This is authentic. So it doesn't get more real than this. But, yeah, but thank you. More real than that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. And my guy's sleeping right there. So oh, that's yeah. great. Even better than ours. All right. So uh, tell us a little bit about you know maybe one or two use cases uh, yeah. coming out of the diameter acquisition that yeah. uh, that enhances the value of your business. Yeah. So um, let's start with all. Because I really do. That's just, you know, I have very personal reasons for wanting to solve the off problem. I just think it's a, it's a, yeah, not only Patty, is it, is it, you know, sort of bad for business? Um, I think it's bad for patient care. Uh, you yeah. know, I think anytime a patient's left standing, uh, you know, at a doctor's uh, front desk waiting for an off to be approved, um, you know, that is not good for, for patient care. So, so that to me is sort of one great example of where, um, you know, even though we've got some great tech that's being applied to the auth problem itself, you still have to empower data in a consistent, uh, logical way so that it can be um, transacted uh, into the payer system. One of our one of our health plan partners is um, Elevance, right? We got to get the got to get the name right now. And I still, thank you, thank I, you for that. Well, no, I still get it. They're one of my okay. investors, and I still get it wrong. Thank you. Um, um, but, you know, to, to that point, right, you know, even even there, right, you've got to be able to push the data into their systems in a consistent, uh, 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 you know, automated uh, way. And so that's one example of where we will put the diameter technology to work is um, upcycling that clinical data that then gets used in a uh, auth UM uh, workflow both for auth determination, as well as ultimately the second phase of that process, which is medical necessity uh, determination. Again, right? If you can get an off and still not have medical necessity approved, so you gotta have a way to pull that clinical data into the system so that you're solving yeah. both problems at once. So, so I think off is a, is a great example of that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll bucket it under the general heading of chart retrieval. Uh, for various purposes. So as you know, today, that chart retrieval process is still a very manual process. You have, you know, thousands of people sitting in the bowels of health systems looking at, you know, paper records all day and scanning those records into some OCR 
uh, system and then pushing them through. Um, ultimately, you know, the plan doesn't is not looking for that entire medical record. They're looking for data elements that are in that metal re medical record to approve, you know, whatever it may be, right? For whether it's a medical necessity determination or you know, HEDIS or, you know, whatever it may be. So um, that's another area where we think there's just a ton of room with what we're doing with diameter to, again, bring that data to life, right? We all know the data is there. It's how do you bring it to life in, a, in an automated uh, way? You know, one of the comments I was going to make about Elevance is there's a, a lot of really smart people there, but one in particular that um, instead of using the term um, uh, just automation, his term is auto adjudication. And he talks about auto adjudication in the context, not just of claims, but in the context of everything from provider directory data, right? So when a provider updates a piece of data about their you know, piece of the demographic data, how do you auto adjudicate that data all the way through the plan system? To clinical data, it's a great example as well, right? Getting the clinical data is one thing, but being able to then auto adjudicate that clinical data through whatever multitude of systems the plan may need, right? Is where we think the real value um, of diameter is and where you can start to really prove ROI because we know what it costs when a human has to intervene in a chart review. Yeah. And, and it's a lot. So yeah. that's a couple of great examples of how we're going to how we're going to. Yeah. It. And these are great uh, financial use cases, right? It's about money, you know, getting prior auth and making sure that a patient doesn't have to pay more than they need to pay. Insurance, you know, kicks in with their part of the deal, et cetera. What about the other side of it? Uh, health outcomes, you know, which is the other side of yeah. our whole healthcare system. Uh, today, population health management using you know, increasingly diverse sources of data, whether it's social determinants, yeah. demographics, et cetera, et cetera. What, what role does your data set and your platform play? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I love that. So, so um, I love the idea of bringing, um, you know, disparate data sources to life around total, um, total care management. You know, so, so I'll get on my soapbox for just a minute, Patty, right? You know, one of the things that frustrates me about the U.S. healthcare system is it is by and large a reactive uh, healthcare system, right? We treat symptoms, we treat diseases, you know, we treat specific diseases. We don't treat real conditions of, you know, human health. And, uh, you know, I'm personally very um, interested and, in, you know, trying to get a lot smarter around things like longevity, right? What can we do to prolong, you know, I'm turning... Um, I, 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 I'm having a generational uh, yeah. a decade change. I, I, I thought they came up with a supplement that does that. Anyway, I could be yeah, wrong. Yeah, exactly, right? So, so, but, but again, to your point, right? And I think one of the reasons that we aren't more proactive in um, managing care and paying for the management of care proactively is it's really hard to prove return on investment, right? We know all day long that if somebody has, you know, high blood pressure, you know, treating it with, a, you know, pharmaceutical product, right? Um, is going to help, you know, treat it, you know, if you have high cholesterol, treat it with a statin, but we don't do anything to get at the underlying um, conditions, which are, which are causing that. And so I'm very excited about the notion of being able to go out and get a lot of differentiated data on people and bring it into the central repository. We talk here at Availability about the, you know, one patient health record, right? That is not just what's happened to you, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of retroactive to becoming sick, right? So, you know, I'm ill and now I'm being treated, but how do we proactively enable providers to know what they need to know about you when you come in, you know, instead of just this, well, how are you feeling today, right? I want my doctor to be able to look at a chart and go, okay, I've been tracking your hemoglobin A1C or I've been tracking your, your, um, your, uh, your glucose level for the last three months. I see where your spikes are. Now let's talk about your diet in way that ways that we can do things and test things to reduce those spikes. Yeah. That yeah. to me is a healthcare system. Now, then the question is, what does availability play in? Yeah. And I think for now, at least where availability plays in that is in a, I don't want to say sort of retrospective, but you ultimately have to have a way to measure what you're getting value from that. And total cost of care, I think is a way that you look at them over time. And so our ability to look at claims and do analytics across claims, Bella, come here. Sorry. Do analytics across claims and know what's going on with the patient. After the fact is where you get a lot of value. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we're, we're um, you know, we've covered a lot of ground here, Russ. I want to I want to switch topics here and talk about digital health. You know, 
in this podcast is mostly about digital health, digital transformation of healthcare. The data and analytics plays a super, super important role in all of that. Yeah. So can you, you, do you work with digital health startups? Do you work with these emerging breed of technology companies that are getting data directly through their applications and through their services, but also want to tap into other data sources such as yours? Do you work with them? Do you yeah. enable them? Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, a digital health startup founder who's listening to this, you know, what, what should yeah. they know about you? So, so Patty, on the topic of digital health, you know, I think digital is another highly overused term, not unlike population health and interoperability and AI. You know, all that sort of stuff. Um, to me, digital health is about user experience. That It really is that simple. And how do we apply data how do we make data smarter and apply it into a interactive user experience that drives a high net promoter score, that drives user satisfaction, that gives people the answer to questions they need, that is sort of proactively anticipating the questions that are going to be asked um, and answering those questions uh, in the, you know, in a very logical way in the workflow. And then the example I always use, and not a lot of people can relate to it, but you know, I'm a, I'm a pilot and um, I fly what's called a glass uh, panel, which means I'm looking at a screen just like you're, I'm looking at two computer screens uh, when I'm in the cockpit. And that has evolved over decades from, you know, six different uh, uh, devices and instruments to one glass panel that gives you all the information you need as you need it, even before you need it. It is, it is thinking ahead for you. It is helping you prepare for what's coming next. It's answering questions intuitively. Um, it's applying analytics to the data that's coming in to give you routing information and all sorts of stuff, right? And I think the true, the same needs to happen. Today, today in healthcare, I think we're still very analog in the way that providers and health plans uh, interact with each other. So, so where we're investing as a company is in two particular areas. We're investing in uh, data intelligence and data analytics. We've just hired uh, a woman named Gigi Yen Reed, who was um, principal data scientist for Watson, IBM Watson, and is now our VP of data and analytics. Uh, we're building a team around her. Their job is gonna be to take 13 billion data points and make them smarter, more intuitive, more interactive, to extract insights and knowledge from, from all the data flowing through our network. And on the other side of it, we're investing in our user experience, right? In our, in our, not just our screens, but the way that we um, deliver data to our end users, whether that end user is in an availability application or whether they are um, in an Epic application, right? Because we sell a, frankly, a ton of provider business through our partnership with Epic. Um, or to your point, whether they are um, in a nascent uh, digital uh, platform that some brilliant entrepreneur has um, developed uh, uh, you know, independently, right? So I'll, I'll give you two examples of that. Um, we have a, um, uh, a, a budding partnership with both Rhyme, uh, which was Prior Auth now, now Rhyme, um, around automating the prior authorization workflow leveraging tech that Rhyme has built that creates what I call nodal activity. It's not a very good term, but really being able to, to you know, if you, the problem with the off workflow, Patty, is it's not a transaction, it's a conversation, right? Between disparate systems and health systems and disparate systems in a payer system. So Rhyme has really brought intelligence to those, to that conversation so that they can actually speak the same language. Yeah. So Rhyme is a great example of a partnership where we are, we think, bringing value to a, you know, to a young startup digital company um, to help them get scale. Uh, the other is Vim, uh, or an AFEC at Vim, who's a very close friend. Um, what, what Vim is doing with um, clinical data capture at the, uh, uh, at the point of care. Um, so particularly in, um, smaller uh, EMR and EHR systems is we think very valuable. Uh, and so we are now leveraging them as a uh, as our own point solution, if you will, which we will bring to scale 
to extract and deliver clinical data and insights directly on the provider's uh, desktop. So where we are investing is in building an underlying architecture and an API uh, framework so that we can very easily stand up partnerships with, um, with these, some of these you know, brilliant entrepre young entrepreneurs uh, who are building applications and are sitting there having built something really cool going, okay, now how do I get scale, right? How do I, you know, where can I get to a network where I can actually interact with health plans and providers at scale? We think Availity should be a, a, a logical place for them to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, we're coming up to the end of our time here. I do want to touch on one other topic. Now, there's been an emergence of a lot of data consortiums, you know, Truveda as an example. Yep. And there are other data consortiums that are emerging as well. And we've had the HIEs that have been around for a long time, yep. uh, and then, you know, clearing houses uh, and so on. What are your high level thoughts on where this market is yeah. heading right now? It's a great question. It's, um, so, so, you know, I've been involved in HIE since 2002. <laughs> So I go back a long way with HIEs. And to your point, I think there are HIEs that serve very, very valuable purposes. They figured out a commercial model and they are very relevant as um, data aggregators, um, as, you know, local community, um, you know, uh, voices to create trust around data exchange. And we love partnering with them. Um, we're partnering in Michigan, we're partnering in California, and now with Diameter, we've got a number of other places that we are helping to, um, you know, bring that data to life through the through the Diameter uh, partnerships. I mean, my general view, Patty, is um, there's no lack of data, right? There, there's just there's just a you know, as you know, there's a tremendous amount of data that's available to us. It's what do you do with it? And so, yeah. where you will see us continue to focus. I mean, look, we did we didn't last for 21 years by by not, you know, by not having a good sustainable business model. And I do believe that to the point we were talking about earlier, that some of these disparate um, nascent data elements are going to become more and more important uh, to us. And so finding ways to consolidate that data into an existing workflow um, is an area where I think availability can be very relevant and, and start to, you know, continue to create real value for the end user. What we do today, right, and just transacting claims and eligibility is, is highly commoditized, right? Um, but if you do it at scale like we do, it creates a phenomenal platform that you can build around. Yeah, yeah, and ultimately it's about the last mile. How do you insert it in the workflow where you can yeah. take meaningful action on a real-time basis and make right. it available at the right time to the right people? Exactly Fantastic. Ross, uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. We could go on a lot longer, but this has been great. I really appreciate the time you've set aside. All the very best to you and uh, the Diameter team and the acquisition and hope everything works out fantastically well. We'll be following your success. Well, thank you, Patty. It's been great to join you today. Bye now.